Bullet Boys emerged from Los Angeles, California as part of the last wave of hair metal which occurred from the late 1980s to the early 90s. Although they'd show promise during this time, their success would be brief, while continued bad blood and an ill-fated reunion would cause the original lineup to implode. Today, let's look at the history of Bullet Boys. In 1987, Bullet Boys would materialize when several members of the band King Cobra, a splinter outfit of drummer Carmine Apiece, opted for a fresh start. Mick Sweda, who had put together Bullet Boys as their lead guitarist, discussed the state of King Cobra at the time, telling the publication Full and Bloom, the band was kind of in trouble trying to keep its head above the water, and Carmine was willing to do anything to secure some kind of deal and keep it going. He ended up getting in touch with Gene Simmons, and we ended up recording some songs that he and Paul had written. At the time, he was planning on signing us to Simmons Records. Nothing really came of that, so I'd formed the band shortly after that. Alongside Sweda came frontman Mark Torian, second guitarist David Michael Phillips, and bassist Lonnie Vincent. David would be the first to leave this new configuration, and they go down to a four-piece. Meanwhile, the three members proceeded to play several shows with a temporary drummer, but the group would keep Torian's longtime friend Jimmy DeAnda in mind, after he impressed them during a rendition of the Led Zeppelin song Misty Mountain Hop. Once the drummer's seat was vacant again, Torian encouraged DeAnda to audition. Initially, DeAnda expressed having some reservations as he was committed to his own band, Nasty Habit, telling vinyl writer music, Honestly, I didn't want to because I thought I had something. My idea ended up being what Rage Against the Machine was. When I listened to their first album, I was like, holy sh**, this is kind of what I had. You know, big guitar, but a guy who raps and has a scream. I was like, oh my god. But of course, I'm sure I wasn't the only one that thought of putting that peanut butter and jelly together. That's why I hesitate to join Bullet Boys, because I thought I had a really good idea. But after DeAnda's hesitance caused bassist Lonnie Vincent to storm out of the room, the band's manager Dave Kaplan ultimately convinced the drummer to join, with DeAnda recalling, I remember I walked outside, the manager had already talked to Lonnie, and then he pulled me aside and said, Jimmy, can I talk to you for a few minutes? I said, sure. And after he talked, he goes, how would you like to have free drums and free cymbals? I go, I would love that. He said, join the band, you'll get them. And I go, I'm in. As fate would have it, DeAnda would be the right fit for Bullet Boys, since they'd play only a handful of shows before commanding the attention of major labels. But they'd be especially lucky considering that most of their energy went towards rehearsing and songwriting rather than playing gigs. The band eventually settled on Warner Brothers and were signed to the label in 1988 by Ted Templeman, who'd also step in as producer for the band on their first record. Guitarist Mick Sweda would recall the experience of when they got signed, while also elaborating on their circumstances, saying, I remember our manager bringing our advance check, looking at it, taking pictures with it, and everything. You have to understand that when we started this band, none of us had jobs. We didn't have any money coming in. In fact, I was driving, picking up Lonnie in my old 65 Mustang, and maxing out a gas card that I had no idea how I was going to pay off. We just spent 6, 8, 10 hours a day rehearsing and writing songs. Sweeta would go on to mention that despite their advance being six figures, each member couldn't really afford to spend any money outside of the band, adding, At that point, I had enough to buy a little Nissan pickup truck, but you had to stash a lot of that money away just to keep things going. We were given pretty meager salaries, and it wasn't a go out and buy your mom a house kind of moment. The same year Bullet Boys headed to one to one studios in Hollywood and spent two months recording their self-titled debut album. Ted Templeman, who is best known for his production work with Van Halen, would produce the record, and one of the album's highlights would be the cover of the OJ song For the Love of Money, with Sweden noting it was Templeman's intuition recalling to Sleaze Rocks, I made a demo of it and had it laying around. I could never get Mark to come and sing on it. For whatever reason, he was too busy or he was doing something else at the time, so that demo just sat on my 4-track, and when we were recording the first record, Ted pulling me aside and said, Mick, do you have any other songs? We need to maximize our efforts here. I pulled out the cassette, so I'm scanning through the demos, and then the song comes up. I tried to hit the pause button. I wasn't quick enough, and Ted says, whoa, whoa, wait, what is that? So I explained it was for the love of money. I thought that Mark would blow that out of the water, but I didn't think the guys wanted to do covers. Ted immediately replied, we're going to do that tonight. 
Even with the general camaraderie in the studio, there was some tension with Templeman's involvement at the time. With Sweeta recalling, Ted was often absent from the studio, and as a superstar producer, he had other priorities, so if he didn't feel like coming in for a week, then he didn't have to. But because of that, the album ended up being way more expensive than it needed to be, and kind of put us behind the eight ball before we started. Despite Bullet Boy's financial setback, their self-titled debut album was released on September 20th, 1988 to critical acclaim and things would continue to look up. By December, the band opened up for Cheap Trick and the album produced a moderate hit with the single Smooth Up In Ya and the next year their cover of the OJ song For The Love Of Money would be released as the follow-up single. In addition to that, they'd also land an opening slot for Cinderella on their Long Cold Winter Tour. Both singles would chart decently on the US mainstream rock chart, and they'd receive regular rotation on MTV, where the band even performed both songs on the network's live call-in show, Mouth to Mouth. Eventually, the album would peak at number 34 on the album charts in America and achieve gold status, signifying that half a million copies were sold in the country. By 1990, Bullet Boys completed their touring cycle for the album and began working on their follow-up Freak Show. At this point, the band opted for a more blues-oriented sound, with the end of recalling this period as being more hands-on, saying, It was really all of us and it was nice because it really felt like I was collaborating with Mick and Lonnie at different times and then we'd get together in a room. Conversely, the long time spent touring took its toll on frontman Mark Torian, who began losing his singing voice and was largely absent from these writing sessions. On top of having surgery to remove nodules from his throat, he'd also be in rehab for drug addiction and would contribute vocals on his own time once he was better. Freak Show would be released on March 12, 1991, and of the three singles put out for the album, two of them would be covers, with Bullet Boy's rendition of Hang On St. Christopher by Tom Waits peaking as high as number 22 on the US mainstream rock chart. From there, the band would embark on another national tour, including various clubs and theater shows. By the end of the tour in late August though, the album had only reached number 69 on the Billboard Hot 200 charts, and was both a critical and commercial failure. Their follow-up album Zaza, released in 1993, wouldn't fare any better, despite having a sound that was more in line with alternative rock. In fact, it would be their last album for Warner Brothers, and Mick Sweeta would recall the moment that made him snap, telling Full and Bloom, We did a show in Dallas, and I remember he was late as usual, referring to their singer. When he finally gets there, he starts going off and berating all these other successful bands like Warrant and Skid Row. That was our sound check, just him bitching basically. I gathered everyone else upstairs and said, this is it, I'm done. I'll see this record through, promote it, and see if it'll do well, but I'm not making any more records with this guy. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Sweeta would go on to say that Torian would make a call to Warner Brothers to terminate the promotion for Zaza altogether, but he'd also note the singer's control on the band early on, adding, From day one of Bullet Boys until that day, that stuff went on almost endlessly. It was basically damage control from day one. Both Sweeta and Deanda would quit the band that year, which signaled the end of the original lineup for the time being. By 1995, Torin and Vincent retained Bullet Boys moniker and assembled a new incarnation of the band, going in a more alternative rock direction, releasing their fourth album Acid Monkey on an indie label. However, it proved to be another flop, prompting the band to break up once again. Later on in the decade, Bullet Boys continued touring under various temporary lineups, and Cleopatra Records would tide fans over, releasing a best of album titled Burning Cats and Amputees in 2000. By 2003, the band started their own label, Bullet Boy Records, and their fifth album, Sophie, would be released on October 24th that year, and was their lone release for the label. Sophie would mark a return to their hard rock sound and even featured a guest spot by frontman Sebastian Bach, who appears on the second track, Neighborhood. While the release of Sophie was planned to include an accompanying tour alongside LA Guns in Black and Blue, Misfortune would strike the band as their tour bus would break down two separate times. Making matters worse during a stop in Detroit, there was a stabbing incident involving the band's bus driver and tour manager, causing the band to leave the tour after just a handful of shows. An archived report from the morning it happened would read, According to witnesses, the driver of the bus stabbed Marque Rojas after an argument. Mark Torian would recall the situation at the time, telling the publication Brave Words, He literally tried to kill him. When something like that happens on the road, it's just a bad omen. After the bus driver was sent to jail, we found out that he had been wanted for attempted murder, and that he had a big gun on the bus that nobody had known about. I just didn't feel comfortable continuing after that, so we decided to pull out. 
With another tour for 2004 failing to materialize, Bullet Boys would take some more time to recoup and began 2006 playing the Raven's Heart Benefit Show alongside members of Guns N' Roses, Queens of the Stone Age, and Dio. Bullet Boys would release four more albums over the next several years, with their latest being 2018's From Out of the Skies. Then on December 12, 2019, fans were surprised to learn a reunion of the original lineup including guitarist Mick Sweda, bassist Lonnie Vincent, and drummer Jimmy DeAnda was confirmed. But the pandemic in March of 2020 brought the tour to an abrupt halt. Unfortunately, the reunion would also stop once again in 2022 due to conflict behind the scenes. DeAnda would discuss the band's original implosion telling Vinyl Rider Music, Larry asked me to stay on for the last three or four shows and I did, and then during that time it just became such a fiasco and there's so many negative things that are happening. Then I quit, and then the show at the Whiskey A Go Go rolls around and there was more drama, and then Larry the manager quit, then Mick called me and goes, dude, I did not sign on for this, this was just way too much He couldn't deal with it, so then he quit. I've only heard through the grapevine that Lonnie quit, I haven't talked to him yet, but I heard he was like, dude, there's no way I'm going back. Just me and Mark is not going to happen. As of 2022, Mark Torian tours with a new lineup of the band with him on vocals and guitar. Despite the controversy over Torian remaining as the only original member these days, reception to the new lineup has been mostly positive. That does it for today's episode, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. We'll see you again on Rock and Roll Your Stories.